Okay, let's get back the sources. Oop. Right. Okay, so the sources should be back on. So good evening, everybody. Welcome to my Shia on looking out for victims of child abuse and the uh, reporting them to the authorities. I'm sure some of you are aware of the uh, scandal that was over the last few weeks uh, in the uh, in Nazi Israel with Chaim Walder. Uh, and his eventual suicide last week. So I don't want to get too much into the particulars of that case because A, I'm not a big expert in that particular case, but B, that will lose something. I want to talk in general about, um, about whether we can talk about these things, whether we can uh, report them to the police, whether we can uh, maintain people are guilty. And the reason why I want to do this, first of all, a couple of people have asked me for it, but B, this is something I feel very, very strongly about. Oh, that's right. I meant to get my uh, Yom Kippur Machzer, but I forgot. So I'll get it from here. And that is, I said a few weeks ago when we were, no, I'll get it from here. We, um, I've got it, have Torah of Yom Kippur. That's what I wanted. So I said a few weeks ago when we did the Rabbi Sachs uh, Memorial Evening, that one of the things that really impressed upon me about becoming a rabbi when I was a young boy, I was 12, is Rabbi Sachs put out a little pamphlet in shuls before Rosh Hashanah, and he quoted from Rabbi Soloveitchik's Halachic Man. Uh, which I only just got a few weeks ago when somebody was throwing it out, and I took it. Page 91, I still remember the reference, and I'll read it out. <laughs> Mayor Berlin told me that once from Chaim of Brisk, the Brisk Rav, right? So it's a great rabbi, was asked, what is the function of a rabbi? Reb Chaim replied, and this has made a huge impression upon me, to redress the grievances of those who are abandoned and alone, to protect the dignity of the poor, and to save the oppressed from the hands of his oppressor. Neither ritual decisions nor political leadership constitute the main tasks of a rabbi. And that made a big impression upon me. You know, you think about uh, teaching Torah, you think about, um, you know, all the things that we do and uh, so on, but that's not the main point. The main point is to look after people who basically can't look after themselves. People who are abused, people who are taken advantage of. And that's something that's something I'm very passionate about. And just to take it a little bit further, if you look through Tanakh, there are many examples I was looking at and I could have used to describe the prophets telling the Jewish people to get on better with people. We know HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Melech Oyev, Tzedak of Mishpat, we say three times a day in Shemun Esra. Hashem who loves Mishpat, he loves Tzedak, he loves justice. And if you think about the Tanakh, I'm going to read the Haftorah for Yom Kippur because that's something people might recognize. And also if it was chosen as the Haftorah for Yom Kippur when we're looking for forgiveness, obviously it means something more. But you think about it. Times of the base, I make this. These people were giants of Torah. These were not just some uh, Amorites, <laughs> I'd say. These were giants of Torah. You know, Shlomo HaMelech, he was the one who came up with Erevin and Washington Tears Yedayim. David HaMelech, King David, he came up with the Yichud, not to being secluded with women. You talk about David HaMelech in Psalm Kuf Yud Test, a big, massive, long psalm that has each letter of the Aleph Bes eight times, the Tamania Abbey is called. Every verse except for two mentions Torah and Mitzvah. So we're talking about giants of Torah here, right? And the second Beis Amikdash, the Mishnahis, were written the last hundred years of the Beis Amikdash. Hillel, the famous Hillel, was at the time of the second Beis Amikdash, and Rabbi Akiva, <laughs> rabbis, giants of Torah. So we're not talking about people who weren't learned people. We're talking about great rabbis. <laughs> And they were warned that this is the Torah for Yom Kippur. And it says things like, let me read it in English. They pretend to seek me in my desire and knowledge of my ways, like a nation that acts righteously and has not forsaken justice of its God. But, I, but you see not when we fasted, we afflicted ourselves, but you ignored it. We said to God, you ignored our fasts. Why are you ignoring us? So God replies, because on your fast days you sought out personal desires and you oppressed all whom you aggrieved. Because you fast with grievance and strife and strike with a wicked fist. You do fast as befits this day. You do not fast as befits this day to make your voice heard above. And he goes on and on and on about open the bonds of wickedness, dissolve the groups that pervert justice, let the oppressed go free and annul all perverted justice. So we're talking about. As I said, great giants of Torah are being told that they're perverting justice. They are not helping the oppressed. So to me, I think of these type of things where we look at people who are abused and so on, and we sometimes we favor the 
people who are doing the abuse, the perpetrators, we protect them. But at the same time, we are transgressing these ideas of not looking out for the oppressed, not helping those who can't help themselves. That is the main thing that Hashem wants from us, to have justice, to be fair to all. And that's a brief introduction because it's, uh, I want to get through it, I want to get through it, but that's why I take it so seriously. It means a lot to me. I have a, um, some files open on my computer that I, when I see Dvatoros, I read things and I think of things, I put them into these folders, different headings. And one of these headings was about reporting the abuse. So these sheets were very easy for me to make. I just had to copy and paste from a few things that I, I, I already have. I save them up when I see things, things that are important, things I want to remember. I write them down or, 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 or I copy them in there uh, and, and so on. And these are one of the topics that are close to my heart. So I'm going to start with a little bit of a disclaimer. Of course, these are my views and what I understand. Uh, well, obviously, I'm going to be quoting a lot of uh, modern day great rabbis um, and so on. First thing I want to say is that a lot of people talk about this being a Jewish problem, a Haredi problem, but it's not. If we look in the world at large, yes, there are cases in the Jewish world, the Haredi world, but you look, the Catholic Church also was grappling with this. A lot of Me Too movements we've seen in the press, right? Many uh, celebrities have, have gone to jail recently, right? For things. So it's not just a Jewish problem. I think it's more of a modern problem in the sense that people were getting away with this for many, many years. And now people are not getting away with this. They're getting caught. They're getting held to accountable. Uh, and people don't know how to handle it. Uh, it's new. It catches people uh, off guard. And therefore, I don't just think it's a Jewish problem. And to say, oh, a Jewish problem, a Haredi problem, to po point the fingers, I think is, is, is not the best way to go. Each case, obviously, is, is, is sad and, and very upsetting. But uh, to point the fingers so on is a, uh, is, is a disservice, I believe. Second thing is I spoke to a, uh, a, a lawyer in England, prosecuting lawyer. And he said, first of all, the term abuse is very, very broad. When you talk about rape, the act is very well defined. Okay, you can argue about consent or not consent, but the, the acts are very much defined. When it comes to abuse, it's very, very, very wide ranging from one end of the spectrum where we're talking about having acts done or performed to uh, the people to the other end where you're making people feel uncomfortable in harassment and anything else in between is all considered abuse. Sometimes, myself, when I hear somebody's been accused of abuse, you think of the worst type of abuse, that's how we naturally think. But it doesn't necessarily always mean that that is the case. Not, I'm not belittling things, so, uh, that's not what I'm saying. But uh, there is a wide range of, uh, a, a wide gamut of, of things that come under abuse. The next thing I'd like to say is, as he said, that you can't get away from the fact that any society, any court system, Jewish or non-Jewish, you have to have some evidence. Right? And as sad as, and as horrible as you think it might be, the only real way you have evidence is with people coming up and talking about what they've done and, and uh, whatever the court system is. Because usually, obviously, these things are done in private, so there's no videos and there's no uh, people watching and there's no uh, witnesses. So unfortunately, the only thing that does count as witness and testimony is the people themselves. And that's difficult and puts people understand and it puts people off coming forward. But there is an issue with evidence and if people come forward, then that's why sometimes many, many years later, because I think that everybody believes they're the only one, all right? Every victim believes he's the only victim. So he feels, eh, who am I? I'm gonna, he's gonna say who, tell me that uh, nobody's gonna believe me, little me, I'm a little schnips, I'm a kid, he's some big fellow, right? Some big rabbi, some great fellow. So everybody thinks he's the only one. And then once a couple of people come forward, you're like, ooh. So if somebody else, and then you see more, and that's why we end up with this time sometimes 15, 20 years later, we end up with it all coming out at once. Because when people hear that there are many more people, that's when they come forward. So the first thing we need to talk about from a halachic point of view is what about this evidence? Because it's very hard to get from the evidence. And we know in Yiddish guy, you put somebody to death, you have to have two witnesses, right? And in a formal based in setting, right, whether we like it or not, there are rules. It's only from a male adult witness connected to it. If you admit to a capital case, um, I hear some noise. Probably want me to mute. 
but now that I have all my tools, I'm going to Oh, yeah. Uh, um, I'm going to stop sharing because I'm going to mute because I hear some noise. So give me a second. Uh, okay, right. Let me mute everybody. Better not mute myself. That might be a bit of a problem. Okay. Hold on. Get back now to where I am. Okay, mute all. Allow participants to mute themselves. Yes, in case you stop hearing me and somebody needs to unmute themselves to uh, tell me that. Okay. So I have muted everybody. Good. You should be able to hear me. Thumbs up if you can hear me. No thumbs up? Ah, now I get the thumbs up. Good. So you can all still hear me. Okay. So let's go back to sharing my screen. So I can't see you. So if I go off or you stop me, please unmute yourself. And then I can uh, shout at me um, and tell me that uh, I've gone off. Right. I don't know if anybody here brought the sources with them. Uh, or I sent them out by email if you have them on your phone. Okay. So the first thing we want to talk about is evidence. So we usually assume that in a base, then you need to have evidence, you need to have witnesses, right? Um, and uh, we pass gun, I mean, there are a p different opinions, but we pass gun, even if you have what you literally might call a smoking gun uh, in a room, there's two people, the one person got a gun smoking and residue all over his hands. From a halachic point of view, that's not accepted. You have to see it as a bit, that's brought down ways. So what would happen in the case of abuse where there very is uh, little formal evidence? So we come straight to the Gemara in Kiddushin, 81a. That's the first source, source number one, where it says, and I have it in Hebrew here by me, that the Gemara is talking about Yechud, and you're not allowed to seclude yourself with women, and what if you do seclude yourself with women? Do you get lashes? Do you not get lashes? So a whole backwards and forwards. Uh, and the answer to the Gemara says, you don't give lashes in case people will say that the children are mamzerim and we don't want to have mamzerim. However, Rebbe Ashi says... That you do malke or machriz, um, malkin al shmua loy toiva. We give malkus lashes again. So, this is not just we say somebody's good, we give somebody lashes, right? The 39 lashes on a rabbinic level, al shmua lo tova. For somebody who has, what did I translate it here? Disseminated rumors. If there are rumors coming out about people that they have done, in this case, it's talking about adultery, right? There are rumors of a sexual nature about people then you can give them Malkus. And the Gemara goes on to prove it by Ailey, uh, that Ailey was the, uh, 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 the Kohen Godel and his children were not going on a good way. And he, he complained to his children, I heard rumors about you, it says in Tanakh, that you were stealing the sacrifices. And it says you're allowed to give lashes. Now, if you think about it, why is this idea? Because there's very little evidence in certainly adultery cases, right? Because these things are done in private by the very nature of the sins. So you're not going to get evidence, right? So therefore, rumors is how you hear things. Oh, yes, I saw them going in and the this and that. That's how you hear things. If you hear these rumors that people have been doing uh, sins like that, then you can give them Marcos. We already see that rumors has some weight when it comes to sexual sins. We already see that clearly from the Gemara, right? That's the first source to say that already when we hear rumors, strong rumors, we can hear. So let's look at the Rambam, codify of Jewish law. And uh, I have it here in Hebrew, but uh, let's read it in English. Shorts too. This is in Hilcha Sanhedrin, right at the end, chapter 24, halacha 5. Similarly, at any time and in any place, a court has the license to give a person lashes. This is based on our Gemara, like we just said. Persian has a right to give lashes if he has a reputation for immorality and people gossip about him, saying that he acts licentiously. This applies provided the rumor is heard continuously. Right? If somebody makes up a rumor one day and it goes away the next day, right? people make up rumors once. But if the rumors keep coming and coming and coming, then we are allowed to give him lashes, as we explained. And he does not have any known enemies that would spread this unfavorable report. Right? Sometimes people have terrible enemies. There was a story about a rabbi, a chazan it was. And they actually, what they did was, it was worse. They actually set him up with a woman and they framed him and they got him. Um, and it was a whole bad story. Um, so sometimes people do have enemies that try and frame them and, and start bad reports, right? And, uh, but usually those reports are small. So you don't hear reports of 5, 10, 15, 20 women accusing people, right? If you have an enemy and you're trying to get somebody, you may have two or three people at the max, 
because it's hard to get people to lie on such a grand scale. So you see from here that when rumors are coming, and in the case of Walder again and other people, once it starts going, usually it only gets worse because the more people hear about, oh yes, I was abused too, and more people come forward. So the more people are coming forward, that's considered more and more rumors, more and more rumors that A, you can believe, because now we get to a case where it comes to, and this is in specifically related to sexual immorality and abuse and so on, because of the very nature of these sins are in private, are now hidden. So therefore rumors and seeing and spotting and noticing, those are the ways that people get found out and people get, uh, people get, uh, people get done. I put a wrong reference, Rambam Deus 24.5. I don't know why I did that. It's actually the next sim in there in here. But I came across the Gemara and Megillah, which we're about to lead tomorrow in the Dafyomi. It goes even further and it says, that you are allowed to humiliate and scorn people who have a bad, uh, who have a bad uh, reputation for immorality and so on. And uh, I was just looking before here, the shul have the art school gemaras, and, um, and it says that, um, that one is allowed to assault people by saying to the mother that you are the son of an adulteress, or that your mother is an adulteress because we want to try and stop people doing these things and so on. And therefore we see not only is he allowed to believe people who have a strong rumors, continuing rumors that they are philanderers or in our case abusers and so on, but we're even allowed to scorn them and embarrass them. It is important to note, says Archgol, that this ruling applies only to one who constantly transgresses this, right? So we're talking about people who are constantly abusing people like we hear, right? It went on for many years and constantly more and more people coming out. However, if it's someone is not known to be a transgressor, becomes a subject of rumors, it is forbidden to rely on those rumors for the purpose of this halacha, um, in terms of embarrassing them. Once, you know, you hear one rumor about somebody, that's not enough to start going publicly shaming them and embarrassing them. But once they have a rumor, that's why we're allowed to put on websites, what's it called, uh, like the Sex Offenders Registry, we're allowed to promote who's there. It's not lost and horror. It's not in problem of embarrassing. The Gemara is very clear. We are allowed to embarrass and harass, not harass, embarrass and insult these people because at the end of the day, we have to protect ourselves. So now we've seen, we've built it up a little bit that we can rely on rumors, constant rumors. And in these cases where you have many more people coming and it's becoming more and more believers, say, well, there's five, there's 10, there's five, you know, it gets more and more. These are strong rumors. Then there is definitely halakhic precedent for believing these people. So the next thing we have to know is Lashon Hara. Now, this is in Hebrew. Um, this is from the Pischei Tshuva. And I saw this, actually, somebody put this on Twitter, Motsi Shabbos. A rabbi was having a debate with him about it. Uh, I said, this will be great for Shiduchim. And uh, he, he, he put this reference. He, he sent me where it was from. He put it on Twitter, Motsi Shabbos. If you follow me on Twitter, you'll see the uh, uh, conversation I was having. He put this on from Twitter. Uh, and this is from the Pischei Tshuva, Reb Mordechai Issa. Issa in, in the, uh, who lived from 1827 to 1889. So sort of recent. And to paraphrase, he says, and I've said this here to people here, that sometimes people use Lush and Hara as a controlling tactic. Oh, no, you can't say anything. It's Lush and Hara. Yes, Lush and Hara is a great sin. And we must be careful what we say. But sometimes people use Lush and Hara to control people. And he used, listen, listen to his language. It's a great sin, which is refraining to speak when it is necessary, that we need to speak to save those who are being oppressed. Oh, Lush and Hara, we can't say. No, it's just the opposite. And he goes on further to say, there is a mitzvah, you're not allowed to stand by when somebody is getting killed. Not literally means you're not allowed to stand on your brother's blood. But you're not allowed to stand by while your brother's being killed. Oh, yes, he's being killed and I can easily save him. Right? So the same is here. You're watching, you're seeing, you know, you're trying to... Say it's lost and hard. No, you're transgressing the of helping. I think everybody, a good example of this is if you saw somebody murdering somebody, nobody would think twice about going to the police. Am I right? Oh, he murdered somebody. Oh, no, he's got to be. So it's the same idea. When things are so serious, um, there is no issa of lost and horror. We have to help people. And the more you help people by spreading certain things that are, you have multiple rumors, more people come forward and more people can get help. We've seen today that there is no question. Um, I meant to say this at the beginning, actually. I have a Dvar Torah that it's, when it talks about the uh, punishments for rape and for, for, for uh, impartial shoftim, 
um, when it talks about the punishments for having adultery with a married woman, uh, if it's consensual, they both get uh, killed. If it's if it was rape, if the man raped a married woman, he gets killed and she doesn't. Why? Just like somebody who gets up and kills somebody, the person who got killed didn't know it was coming, it's not his fault. So is this, that the rape is equated to murder. And the Gemara learns out halachas that just like uh, murder, you can save yourself. So also when it comes to rape, you can save yourself by killing the rapist. So I'm just coming to rape, you're allowed to kill them, which we're going to see soon. But I learned another thing from it, that what the Torah is trying to say, if you rape somebody, you abuse somebody, it's like you've killed them. We see that today, that some of these people, unfortunately, so sad or irreparably damaged. Baruch Hashem, a lot of them are able to, to get over it and lead good lives, especially with therapy. Baruch Hashem, it's, 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 but some people never recover. And some people, it takes away some of their whatever. Baruch Hashem, I've never been through it. Um, and and, and, and uh, it takes away their, their innocence, their, their something. So a bit of their life is gone. It's like you've killed them. So it's clearly a, a serious, it's not, a, ah, who cares, whatever. No, what happens is a, has serious consequences for these people's lives. So the next thing we're talking about, Lashon, ah, we know what people talk about is Masira, Mosa, right? The Gemara says one is not allowed to give over Jewish people to non-Jewish Authorities, we know that Eila Hamish Partim Asher Tosim Lifnei. We're going to say in a few weeks. These are the rules that I've given before you, before you, and not before the goyim. Right? We don't take people to secular court, right? Unless it's not something the base thing will rule on, or the base thing give permission. Really, one is not supposed to go to secular court if one could go to the base thing, right? People are all frightened of this. Oh, and then the Gemara gives even more serious, serious rhetoric about people who would be most who would give over Jewish people to non-Jewish authorities. Um, so that's the next thing people say. Well, no, oh, we can't uh, say anything. We can't report anything because of most. So let me uh, go down the screen so people can see. Right. So now, remember, we talked about the halacha, that if somebody is coming to rape somebody, one is halachically allowed to kill them. In the same way, somebody's coming to murder you, you're allowed to kill them. Same as in halacha. I'm not sure what the... I, I meant to try and check up, actually, what is the... Uh, I think Florida is very liberal on these things. Uh, but I meant to try and check up what the American system would say about it. Um, but I forgot. So I don't want to talk about things that I don't know um, about. But uh, certainly in halakhic, if somebody is coming to rape somebody, in fact, even if you see somebody going on trying to rape somebody, uh, one is allowed to uh, say that. We see because it says, because she didn't scream out when the person uh, had consensual relations. So we see, oh, she'd screamed out. What would have happened? People would have come and helped her. And, 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 and killed the person. So it is, if you see somebody going to rape somebody in halacha, you're allowed to, to uh, kill them. So we see that it is very serious, called a rode. If somebody comes to kill you, it's called a rode. If he's chasing after you. So that's the same thing here, is that by reporting people to the police, first of all, and by reporting these things, one is saving future children or adults or whatever it is from basically suffering the same fate. Unfortunately, it appears that people usually it's rarely isolated incidents usually it comes out that these people it's been uh you know even uh, we don't know how many it really is but sometimes it comes five ten it always seems to be more and more and more right we see that even in in, in uh, with a lot of these celebrities and more and more people keep coming out it keeps coming it keeps coming it's rarely an isolated incident it's usually a pattern of behavior so therefore you are saving them literally from being Kills, as we see, you're Rodef, and therefore um, uh, you're saving the future people. And I'm going to read out from the Rambam. This is in Chayvul and Mazik, the laws about people who damage things. And he says like this And thus, all those who disturb and distress society, it is permitted to hand them over to the secular government to be beaten or imprisoned or fine. So the Rambam spells out all those three things that you're worried about. Oh, we give them over to the government, they're going to beat them, they're going to imprison them, they're going to fine them. We see the Rambam clearly. When was the Rambam written? The 12th century, something like that. He says quite clearly, one is allowed to give your nuisance and a menace to society, right? If uh, somebody, a Jewish person, is breaking into your house, you're allowed to call the police. You don't say, oh, he's a Jewish person. I can't call the police. No, you call the police. He's breaking in. He's trying to damage things. You have to call the police. If a Jewish person is running after you, trying to hit you, beat you, kill you, hit you, of course you call the police. Nobody would think twice about that. So it's exactly the same here. Thus, someone who is a public nuisance can be turned over to the police, even if he will be imprisoned. The Chassam Sofer and the Minchas Yitzchok 
And others note that this is connected to Gittin 7a, that even a private nuisance can be turned over to the police if there's no other way of stopping the abuse. So we've now built it up and we see that it is perfectly halakhically acceptable to be able to call the police on a nuisance and a menace and somebody who's uh, disrupting the peace and so on. And therefore the same is with abuse. Abuse, you're clearly saving future people. You might obviously be saving the people there who are currently experiencing it. You're certainly saving future people. And therefore, perfectly halakhically acceptable to turn people over to the police. In the case of Chaim Walder, for instance, lately, um, who was, uh, there was an expose written about him in the newspaper. Uh, nothing was really known, certainly publicly, until Haaretz ran a, a, a story on him, which uh, caused a lot of furore. But again, as we've said, and uh, I spoke about this once also, Rabbi Avina has a great uh, thing about newspapers today, that they do serve a great service. People say, oh, Lashon, I can't believe. Because you have to hold people to account sometimes, right? We all say when we look at the politicians, when, we, when they do exposes on those things, you need to know these things, especially with elected officials or rabbis or teachers or people in authority, right? They do need to be held to account. And yes, one has to be careful with Lush and horror and slander and things like that, of course. But, you know, exposes that are done, um, in this case, to expose people. Uh, and so on. If it was about taxes and tax evasion, that might be different because you're not necessarily harming any people. You're not necessarily harming humans, but anything like this um, or, or whatever um, is acceptable. So they ran this expose and then they set up not a formal based in, but a, a group of rabbis to, to, to meet with the people and discuss it. And I said, I alluded to it earlier, that a formal based in is very difficult in these cases, by the nature of the evidence. A formal based in doesn't accept the testimony of minors, doesn't really accept the testimony of adults about things when they were minors, and they don't accept testimony of women. That's the, 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 the halachics of based in. And as I said, we don't really uh, accept what I call the smoking gun theory, right? We have to have formal evidence, which is all very difficult in a case uh, such as abuse and so on. So therefore, that's why in this world, the case, they set up not a based in. It was something else, just like a, a uh, what you might call it, a, uh, I'm not sure what they called it, but not a formal uh, Din Torah based in as such. Uh, and that's why I have a couple of things here. Source number seven. Shulchan Aruch, Chosim Mishpat 15.5, states that technically based in may accept what they believe is reliable circumstantial evidence and include that as evidence when determining the verdict even though it does not meet the Torah strict guidelines of testimony. This is the shit of Tosfus, who says that if you have a smoking gun, you can put somebody to death based on that evidence. That's what Tosfus in, in Sanhedrin says, but the Rambam and others do not pass in like that. And the Shulchan Aruch is saying, well, technically you could. For example, if one relatives of one of the litigants were to testify, which is not a lack of the acceptable in based in, right? Because those are the rules. If you're, first, if you're a family member, brother, sister, father, grandfather, grandson, first cousin, and so on, uh, you can't testify together. Even if you saw it with your own eyes, you cannot testify. Those are the halachas, those are the rules. But let's say they were to testify. Their testimony is biblically invalid, like we just said. Those are the halachas. Even Moshe and Aaron, right? Moshe and Aaron were two brothers. Are you going to accuse them of lying? No. <laughs> They're probably the most two honest people, the greatest people, Jewish people. But still, halachically, Moshe and Aaron could not come and say testimony together. That's the halacha. Okay, their testimony is biblically invalid, as we just said, but it may constitute circumstantial evidence if basin is assured of the integrity and it therefore influences the verdict. Moving on to number eight. However, the Shulchan Aruch goes on, quoting the Rambam, that nowadays a basin will refrain from relying on circumstantial evidence and when presented with it must exercise patience before reaching a verdict and thoroughly cross-examine the litigants to see if they will admit to witness statements. Now, and then it goes on to say about uh, halakhically surveillance cameras and so on, uh, which I don't really want to get into. But I did see from Rev Cohen, what's his first name? Revival Cohen? Rev Simcha Cohen? Oh, he's a big rob in New York. Oh, I've got his farm. What was his name? Uh, I think it's uh, Revival Cohen. Uh, he wrote lots of farm. What's his? Anyway, he says that there's a big difference here. He says that. This is talking about a basin that's trying to issue punishments, right? Whether it be, we don't do this nowadays because the basin doesn't have the power to put somebody to death, give somebody lashes. Basin doesn't give people lashes nowadays. 
So what is this based in basically doing? This based in is basically trying to convene as to whether we would consider this person a nuisance. Right? This is not assuming we're going to the police, we're leaving all that aside, right? Go to the police and, and the police and whatever uh, the, the secular court system does, that's up to them. But in this sense, it would determine whether somebody would be considered on the balance of probability guilty or innocent. And therefore, that would have implications. Could they get uh, jobs in the Jewish community? I was very pleased, actually, that in this world, the case, that uh, as soon as these stories broke, they fired him from his radio or suspended him from his radio show with immediate effect. A lot of libraries and schools uh, because this person had written lots and lots of books. Uh, I think he sold $50 million worth of books I read or something. Huge uh, book writer. They got rid of his books. Uh, uh, so they did, you know, pending the trials or whatever was going to happen. Uh, he's since committed suicide, of course, uh, as did, unfortunately, one of his uh, victims, uh, which is uh, the whole thing is, 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 is frighteningly sad. Um, she felt that after his suicide, she had to commit suicide. So that just goes to show that, you know, these people are so traumatized that if we don't help them and so on, they can, uh, they can uh, really be troubled. So therefore, you see that sometimes it's not about giving them capital punishments because Basin doesn't have that power nowadays or even giving them lashes like we quoted in the first source that you could give people lashes. Basin can't do that. But you can say enough that would cost them their job, right? As if a rabbi wouldn't be able to be a rabbi, wouldn't be able to work in a school. People would never hire this person in whatever industry, certainly that would uh, involve children or, or women or whatever it is he was accused of. That, says Rav Cohen, you could do because then you wouldn't. You're not doing a biblical court. You don't have to worry about accepting women's testimony, children's testimony, adults' testimony when they were children because you're not doing a formal based in. It's not a Misa based in. It's not a, and, and so on. So therefore he says it is acceptable, which is what they did in um, which is what Rebel Yahu uh, did in this particular case, he set up this private, non formal based in. And then we have the Aruch HaShulchan, Rabbi Gil Michal Epstein, who wrote a, a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, and he goes through all the simonim with a lot more detail, which is a, a great way of truly understanding the in depth of the halachos and the sugyas. He rules like this, Chosh Nemesh, but 3887. And he's very clear. Of all of this, the presence of looting and killing hinges the rules of, this is the similar he talks about kings of England and that they were all over the world. It's fascinating as an Englishman. Anyway, he talks about the British Empire and how they're everywhere and they put their rule of order. Uh, I could have put that in, but um, anyway, it would have only have tickled me and not you. But anyway, it's an uh, interesting symbol. Anyway, so he says, these rules only, this is about not giving over to uh, people over to the non-Jews. These rules apply only to one who informs on another to bandits. And so endangers that person's money and life. As these bandits chase after a person's body and money, and they're not really looking to, uh, to act in a court case. And thus one may use deadly force to save oneself. So therefore he also says, clearly, no problem of Mose, no problem of giving over to a government, whatever it is, it's perfectly acceptable. So therefore we have seen so far that once multiple evidences come out, multiple people are being accused, that's considered rumors, shemua lo tov, a bad, what was the expression translated it here? Um, once we have gossip, what does it say here? What did I translate it here? Disseminated rumors. Once the rumor mill is coming, that this uh, it's it's really building a steam, right? So on balance of probability, wow, so many women, so many children, so many people. Then we are allowed to believe it, and by publicizing it, you are helping other people come forward because that's the only way that people can come forward. And therefore, one is allowed to, if it would be chas v'shalom, one would know of such a thing in one's own family, chas v'shalom, or one's own situation. And as a rob, if you would know it in your, uh, in your shul or whatever it is, or people um, being abused and so on. Uh, because if it's, let's say, a father is, or, or, or a parent is abusing their children, nobody's going to stand up for them, right? Because the parents are the ones that you look to to save you, to protect you. And if they're the ones doing the abuse, who's going to look out for them, if not for other people who know? So therefore, certainly it's permittable to go to the police, call the police, um, and so on. And we're going to finish here with the Pesach of Rav Yashav. There are now three or four letters. This was written in 5764. Uh, that's like 18 years ago. Uh, there are many letters that have been written uh, lately, because of course, this unfortunately has become much more prevalent, uh, or shall I say, it's become uncovered lately, right? This has been going on for a long time. What the Shlomo Hamanach says, Ein kol chadosh there's nothing new under the sun. So Rabbi Yoshev writes, who was the God of Lador, right? And, and uh, so on. He writes very clearly. 
In the language of the Rashi, Bo, the Rabbi Shlomo ben Adair at Spain, 1235 to 1310, one of the foremost authorities in Jewish law, is in his responsa, volume 3, number 393, which I do not have, I've not seen it inside. I always like to see these things inside, um, but I've not seen this inside, so I've, we'll read it here. It is permitted to impose a monetary fine or corporal punishment with penalties and punishments fall outside those prescribed by the Torah, and this maintains society. Because if you will adjudicate based on the laws established by the Torah, this is the Rajbo, not the Rebbe Yasser. This is the Rajbo written in the 1300s, right? If you adjudicate based only on the laws established by the Torah, society will be destroyed. We've said, right? We don't accept women, children. So sometimes we have to, society, now that we live in and so on, we have to use different laws. This is amazing what he says about society will be destroyed. But well, that's the Rajwa. As I say, I haven't seen what the context he's talking about is. But anyway, from the words of the Rajwa, we learn that in matters of that concern societal welfare, the sages of Israel of every generation have the authority to extend their authority and decide matters according to their best judgment. And in the absence of a clear directive contained in the Torah, to stand in the breach. According to my determination that one should report an abuser to secular government authorities, in brackets, police, and it is there. And in this, there is benefit to society. And there were many other letters. Did I have some ready on my computer? I read, um, uh, I think, uh, quoting, for, was it with Moshe Farnstein or one of the other later Gedolim, who said, even if one is going to be imprisoned for life, right? One is going to end up for the crimes being imprisoned for life, perfectly motto to give over somebody. Why? Not that uh, we need justification, because every day that that person is jailed, leaving aside the punishment aspect of it, leaving aside the punishment aspect, the um, every day that this person is in jail, you are saving them from potentially harming other victims, right? So it's a good thing for the society. You're saving society from um, these ills and, and so on. So we've seen, again, to make clear, what time is it here? 8.09. Okay, so let me stop sharing this. Hold on. Give me a second. Stop sharing. Oh, good. Everybody's still there. I was worried you'd all gone ages ago, and uh, I was just talking to the people here. Okay, so we have seen that there is absolutely no issue once rumors have become substantiated, right? Three, four, five, six, and it becomes, you know, wow, this person is really and so on. And I think that one of the reasons why it catches people by surprise and people get all is because usually it's very shocking. Not, of course, the acts and what they do is, is, is terrible and shocking, but it's the people themselves. You're like, whoa, you know, the, so usually the least people you expect, right? Um, you, know, you usually think of the, you know, everyone thinks of their stereotypical image of a dirty old man or whatever being these uh, criminals, right? You know, you think of it and you see it, but you don't expect somebody with a nice beard and a hat or whatever it is, you know, sitting there, you know. So it, it's shocking and it takes people back. And as I said at the start, it's not just a Haredi problem or a Jewish problem. In fact, it's even in the whole world. We see it with celebrities. But if I remember at the time of the uh, Harvey Weinstein thing, people said it was an open secret. I remember said, oh, yeah, people in the industry said, oh, it's an open secret, which goes to show you that it's society that has now changed. These things have been going on. It's terrible. And I'm not condoning it. That's not what I'm saying. But you hear of all these things. Oh, it's open secret for many people. Oh, yes. But nobody did anything about it. Now people are doing things about it. Now people are coming forward. So of course, you have people from 10, 15, 20 uh, years ago, whatever it is, who say, well, in those times, we kept quiet because that was the norm. Now, Society has changed. People are accepting, allowing people the framework and the space to come forward and to be able to express their feelings and their fear. And therefore, one must make sure, like I started my Shia when it talks about Hashem is a lover of justice. Hashem was admonishing the Jewish people many, many times for the fact that they oppress the oppressed and the poor, and the destitute, many times over tonight, you look in Yeshaya and, and Yirmiya and Yechesko, talking many times, and as we said, we're not talking to a generation of people who weren't very uh, Torahic. These were great giants of Torah. It's these sort of things where people think, oh, you know, we will hush it up, we'll keep it quiet, 
people are nervous, people are embarrassed. But as we've seen, A, it's permitted to believe it once the rumor mill starts going. B, as we see quite clearly, it's permitted to embarrass these people, call them names, call them out about it. Thirdly, it's permitted to call the secular authorities on them and so on, right? And fourth, we can do our bit to make sure it doesn't happen. Now, I believe, now this is not in any way to be taken the wrong way and say, oh, I'm trying to say that the uh, people who commit the abuse uh, need, uh, should, uh, and, and the abuse is it's there. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is we do need to be more cognizant of the way people could potentially uh, be enticed and behave. And we should do things to help set up circumstances to make sure that we can best avoid putting children in particular into positions of vulnerability. Uh, I remember when a few years ago, when we had, there was a case in Manchester, somebody now in jail, uh, one of the teachers of the school, the head teacher, changed his door from a non-see-through door to a glass door. He said, I want everybody to be able to see anything going on in my office because you have to balance privacy. People want privacy and same, same as me as a rabbi, right? People come to me for privacy. So you have to balance meeting people in private and so on with, you know, um, putting yourself into to temptations or whatever. And we do have to be more cognizant in schools. And in this case, people assume this guy's a great therapist. We'll just leave our kids to them. He came, made house calls when the parents were away and did things. And so we have to make sure that we stop doing, you know, we have to be careful if it means that uh, we have to have double people uh, in the same way as uh, in, the, in, in the medical field, right? Uh, a male doctor is not allowed to perform certain things without a female nurse being there. So perhaps that is something that is a mitzvah to make sure. Like we said, we have to go out of our way as a road, Dave, to stop these things happening. It's not enough to, when they happen, to be reactive and to say, oh, that's terrible, put attention to the police, send them to jail, boo, 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 boo. We have to be proactive and we have to put in place measures. I mean, Baruch Hashem, our shul, we don't have young kids and so on and so forth, but in shuls and things like that, we have to be more aware, more cognizant of what could be happening. We have to be more open-minded and, and, and so on to what people, even the best of people might do and set up strategies and set up guidelines and set up spaces that will best make sure that children and women and so on and, and, and men as well are best protected. Of course, you can't protect people all the time. And people who want to commit sins will find ways, but we can do our best to be proactive in order to make sure these things happen. And in that's a course of trying to out these people and trying to put them off. We should be zocher to see that Hashem promises that if we look after the poor and the oppressed, we redress their balance, we make sure our justice system is better, we will be redeemed with mishpat. This is the test, perhaps, of the end of Golos. Are we going to have real mishpat, real justice, to really call out these people and call them for what they are and stop it happening again, to be redeemed and see the coming of Mashiach. Amen. Now, I'm going to stop the recording.